Now, some of you have, who have seen me before uh, know that I'm bookish, uh, that I, I read a lot of books. Uh, when I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear, uh, and I decided at that moment I wanted to become a writer. Uh, and I, I wanted to do all through high school. I tell this joke when I, in high school, it's true, I wanted to date a woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy, and I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. But, <laughs> so that wouldn't have worked out. Uh, and then when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, and so I went there. Uh, and as you know, Chicago is also sort of a bookish place. It founded Aspen, among other things, Mortimer Adler and Robert Maynard Hutchins. Uh, it's the famous saying about the schools, it's where fun goes to die. But the <laughs> accurate saying is it's where a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. And, <laughs> And so I went there, and I, I double majored in history and celibacy during my four years there. Um, I, uh, I'm not like today's students, but I did master some of the schools of my students at Yale. I learned to dominate classroom discussion while doing none of the reading. Uh, we had a thing at Chicago called the Seminar Baboon, uh, which is the one who hogs all the, con all the time in the class. Uh, at Yale, they have a different phrase. The person is called the section asshole, the one who... <laughs> And the rule at Yale is if you don't know who the section asshole in that class, you're the section asshole. <laughs> and so again, I did a bookish thing while I was in Chicago. I managed a boxer, uh, the kosher killer. Uh, and we, uh, we actually made it to, but we trained the University of Chicago way. We didn't actually practice boxing. We read books about boxing. Uh, and he this is true. He made it to the semifinals of the Chicago Golden Gloves. And because a series of buys, he didn't beat anybody. Other people got injured. Uh, and so he got into the ring and he'd never boxed in his life. So he came out with his arms swinging like this and the other boxer had never seen anything like this. So he shot back into his corner and just was frozen. And then 92 seconds later uh, realized, well, one uppercut ends this thing and that's what happened. And so that was the bookish career. And I've gone on to a sort of bookish uh, life. I, some of you may know I, I do a show called The News Hour, uh, formerly with Jim Lehrer, now The News Hour. Um, with a guy called Mark Shields, who's been doing it longer than me. Our segment is now called Shields and Brooks. Uh, should have been Brooks Shields. Uh, <laughs> but before that, it was Shields and Coolidge, uh, Shields and Thomas Aquinas. Um, and we have a scholarly seasoned audience. Uh, if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. Uh, I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. Um, <laughs> and so. Uh, that's sort of bookish, and then I, I'm a conservative columnist at the New York Times, and my line about that, it's like being the chief rabbi at Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there. And so the emphasis here is it's all on bookishness and trying to be smart. And I learned how to appear smart in meetings. I read a piece by a woman named Sarah Cooper, that if somebody, if you're in a meeting and somebody mentions a fraction, or somebody mentions a percentage, turn it into a fraction. So if they say 25%, just nod thoughtfully and say, oh, one in four, because that, that seems really smart. Um, and so I continued my bookish life um, as I got older. I think I got a little more in touch with my feminine side. Uh, I'm the only American man to finish that book, Eat, Pray, Love. Um, by page 123, I was lactating, which was amazing. Um, then I wrote a book about emotion, and then I wrote a book about character called The Road to Character about three years ago. Um, thank you. And I, and I learned writing that book that writing a book on character doesn't actually give you good character. Uh, and reading a book on character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character. So, <laughs> so all this is to underline the theme of bookishness. And yet even I, um, who lives up here a lot, uh, have to admit that the, the brain and the cognitive brain is really the third most important part of our consciousness. And that the first is our desiring heart. I read about a guy not long ago who bought a house with a driveway and had a bamboo stand out front. And uh, he didn't like the bamboo, so he chopped it down. He took an ax to the root system. He dug a hole. He plant, poured plant food, plant poison all over the roots, filled it up with three feet of concrete, and then three or four inches of, of uh, concrete on top of that. And two years later, little shoot of bamboo sticking up through there. And that's what we all have in ourselves, which is our desiring heart. We all have desires. We all have wants. We all have needs. We survive by int intimacy. There was a famous study at Harvard, uh, the Grant study, the men who had no deep love in their lives uh, as, as kids 
we're three times more likely to suffer from mental illness through life, 2.5 times more likely to suffer from dementia, made 50% more less money over the course of their careers. Love wires the fibers of the brain together and it determines what we are and we're just filled with desires and love can strike anywhere. I heard a story from a guy in Houston and it was about a, a woman who's a pianist uh, who was about to move to San Francisco to be with her fiance. She decided to get her hair done. So she went to a place called Etude de Paris, a French hairstylist. She walks in, sees a guy cutting another woman's hair and went to the back of the room, puts on her gown, calls her mom and says, I've actually just seen the man I'm gonna marry. She gets out, gets her hair washed. She's sitting in the chair and this guy is cutting her hair. She says, what's your name? He says, my name is David. And David asks her story and she says, well, I'm a concert pianist. I'm about to move to San Francisco to be with my fiance, but I won't do it if you'll marry me. <laughs> and the way David tells the story, uh, he looked down at his scissors and he said, I never felt more free than I did at that instant. And he said, it's a deal. And they've been married 17 years. <laughs> so you never know when love is gonna strike. It doesn't strike most of us that quickly, <laughs> but it does strike us. And what we want from love and what our desiring heart really wants is fusion with another person and with other people. The kind of fusion that Louis de Bernier described in his novel, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. He said, he wrote, he's got an old guy talking to his daughter about his relationship with his late wife. And the old guy says, love itself is what is left over when being in love has burned away. And this is both an art and a fortunate accident. Your mother and I had it. We had roots that grew towards each other underground. And when all the pretty blossoms had fallen from our branches, we discovered that we were one tree and not two. That's what we're looking for. And so that's the desiring heart. The second most important faculty is our yearning soul. Now, I don't ask you to believe in God or not believe in God. That's not my department. I do ask you to believe that there's some piece of you that has no shape, size, color, or weight, but it is of infinite value and dignity and that rich and successful people don't have more of this than the rest of us, younger people don't have less of it than older people, and that slavery is wrong because it obliterates that infinite part of ourselves, which is our soul. And that rape is not just an assault on a bunch of physical molecules, it's an insult to another human being's soul. And obscenity is anything that covers over another person's soul. And what this thing does is it yearns for goodness. I've covered wars, I've covered crime. I've never met anybody who did not want to be good. People who've committed genocide will always say, well, what I did was at least excusable or actually good. Because none of us can live with the thought that we've led bad lives. The weird thing about the soul is it's reclusive. It's very powerful, but it's reclusive. And sometimes early in your life, the soul can be like a, a leopard up in the mountains. It's just, you don't think about it. You're building your career, you're building your family. Then you have hints of it, maybe during a, one of those late nights where, as a poet said, your thoughts come to you like a drawer full of knives, those middle of the night anxiety moments, and suddenly the pain of your soul comes up. Sometimes you experience a moment of insane gratitude or something with your kids, and your heart sort of swells up and you feel the swelling of your soul. But I think in most of our lives, there's a moment when the, the leopard comes out of the hills and sits right in front of the, you in the room in front of you and say, what have you done with your life? What are you for? What are you here for? And those who have given that question no thought have to live with that fact. But most people who were given that thought or who haven't dedicate their something good. And last year in my speech here, I talked about the two mountains. That the people early in their career often think, well, this is my mountain to climb. I'm going to have a good career. I'm going to build a family. I'm going to establish an identity, make a difference in the world. And they get to the top of the mountain. They think, not as satisfying as I thought. And they fall down to the valley. And from the valley, they see, well, that wasn't my mountain. That the second mountain is, was actually the mountain of my life. And that tends to be less about establishing identity, more about shedding the identity, less about building yourself up and more about giving yourself forth. And that's all driven by the power of the soul. And what the soul yearns for most, I think, is moral joy, a state of moral joy, a state when the soul is at peace and warm and glowing. It's the sort of experience that uh, Rabbi Wolf Kelman experienced at Selma, Martin marching with Martin Luther King. He wrote of that moment, marching across that bridge. We felt connected in song to the transcendental, the ineffable. We felt triumph and celebration. We felt that things change for the good and nothing is congealed forever. That was the warmest transcendental spiritual experience. 
Meaning and purpose and mission were beyond exact words. Meaning was the feeling, the song, the moment of overwhelming spiritual fulfillment. And we all meet people who have experienced that moment and some people who just radiate a joy because their life is made up of those moments. I have sat next to the Dalai Lama a few years ago at a Washington function and he's just incandescent. He just radiates with that joy. And he laughs for no apparent reason. And I'm sitting next to him and he would just burst out laughing. I wanted to be polite, so I burst out laughing, and he would laugh, and I would laugh. And at one point, he, I, I didn't know what to say to the guy, so he had a little canvas Dalai Lama bag. So I said, you got any candy in your bag? And he, he pulled out all the stuff in the bag, and it was everything you get in the first class cabin of an international flight. It was a little air plugs, you know, the eye patch, and a nice Toblerone bar. But that is what joy, when people describe feelings of joy, it's often in unison with others, and it's in pursuit of good, and it's always that moment when the skin barrier fades away, where something that seemed you and something that seemed something else meld. The poet David White described it, joy is a meeting place of deep intentionality and self-forgetting. The bodily alchemy of what lies inside us in communion with something that formerly seemed outside of us, but now is neither. Dance, laughter, affection, skin touching skin, singing in the car, music in the kitchen, the quiet, irreplaceable, and companionable presence of a daughter. We've all had that moments where you can't tell who's me and who's you, or just one. And so that's moral joy. So I'm trying to emphasize the heart and the soul, because what's interesting about our society is we've done a pretty good job of screwing that up. Sometimes modern society seems like a conspiracy against that kind of joy. And you think over the last few centuries, one of the things we've done is we've divided ourselves up, and as a result, divided our society up. And if I go through the history, first we had Rene Descartes, who decided the brain, the reason was separate from the emotion, the brain is separate from the body, and Cartesian dualism created this idea that we're brains on sticks. And if you go to a lot of schools, they teach students like their brains on sticks, we'll just load information into you. We have a meritocracy that's defined by SAT scores and IQ. And people get promoted in life by their intelligence, not by their emotional capacities or their spiritual capacities. And so we've decided one side of the, ourselves is really important, the less can be left off. The second thing, the Industrial Revolution and even modern workplaces that treat human beings as just cogs in a machine. The third is the meritocracy itself, where people do not, are not encouraged to see themselves as seats of a soul, but just as human capital to be exploited. And I wrote a book about how we have a system that emphasizes the resume virtues, what can you do in your career, and not so much the eulogy virtues, what are they gonna say about you after you're dead. More subtly is a, a philosophy and a tendency in our culture called reductionism, where we divide everything into specialization. When you divide an academic career or a business life into specialization, you chop everything down to its discrete units that discourages you from looking at the whole of your life. And so students may study 13th century Danish basket weaving or some piece of algae, but they're never encouraged to say, well, what is the purpose of my life? How do I find that? And reductionism divides the whole purpose into a series of slices. It divides reality into a whole series of slices. And then finally, and to me the biggest one, is individualism, a culture of individualism that says we're all very separate from each other and that what happens is what goes on in ourselves and not with each other. We used to live in a culture not long ago that was very community oriented. If you went to Chicago in the 1930s or 40s or 50s, you would meet people and they had gone into the same business their dad went into and their granddad, maybe the Nabisco plant. They were part of the same union. They, there, there was no TV and not much air conditioning that back then. So in the summer, the doors were wide open and the kids were running from home to home and the families were knitted together by coffee clutches and barbecues and babysitting cooperatives. And if somebody asked you, where are you from? You didn't say, I'm from Chicago. You said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski. You picked your corner because that's how tight your little community was. And if you wanted to work for something, you didn't go off on alone. You worked for the machine. You worked for a big organization. There was a guy named John Ferry who was, wanted to go into politics, so he worked for Boss Daly's machine. And at the end of his career, Boss Daly gave him a reward, sent him to Congress. And the reporters asked him, well, how are you going to vote when you go to Congress? And John Ferry said, I'll go to Washington and represent Mayor Daley. <laughs> For 21 year, years, I represented the mayor, and he was always right. 
And so that was a tight community and had a lot of good virtues. Really, people were close to each other. And there was an ethos of humility. It had some bad features, too. It tolerated racism, tolerated sexism, anti-Semitism, emotional coldness. The food was really boring. <laughs> we had a sort of a guest house culture, which Rabbi Jonathan Sachs called a guest house culture. If you're a white wasp elite, it was your culture. Everybody else could be in the culture, but they had to be like guests in your house. And that was intolerable to people. And so they began to chop up that culture. And they said that culture is too conformist, too collective. We need more individuality. And the culture shifted in the 60s. And the symptom of that culture was one of the highlights of my childhood, Super Bowl III, 1969 or 70. The, Indianapolis, or the Baltimore Colts facing the New York Jets, two quarterbacks on the field, both of whom grew up within miles of each other in western Pennsylvania. One of them, for the Colts, was a guy named Johnny Unitas. It's a 1950s kind of guy. Crew cut, kind of boring, played football like a plumber, never showed off. Very modest and humble. And the other side of the guy was my childhood hero, Broadway Joe Namath. $5,000 fur coats, coats and ads, fur pantyhose, long hair, he was a swinger. Namath wrote a memoir called, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. <laughs> Johnny Unitas would not have written that memoir. <laughs> and so that was a shift from a collective culture to an individualistic culture. And it great us, gave us a lot of great things. It gave us the civil rights movement, feminism, the peace movement. I don't think we could have had the creativity of Silicon Valley without that rebel individualistic spirit. And so it graded us all those things. It gave us some bad things too. A rise in narcissism. And I wrote about this in The Road to Character. They have this thing called the narcissism test where they say, I'm gonna read you a bunch of statements, does this apply to you? And there's statements like, I find it easy to manipulate people because I'm so extraordinary. Or, <laughs> I love to look at my body, somebody showed a biography about me. The media's narcissism score has gone up 30% uh, in the last 20 years. Americans are 25th in the world in math performance. If you ask Americans, are you really good at math? We're number one in the world in thinking we're really good at math. <laughs> and with this has gone a, a rapid increase in the desire for fame. My favorite study of this is they ask college students, would you rather have a life that involves a lot of sex or a lot of fame? Uh, and by two to one, they'd rather have the fame. And I say to them, listen, I'm on TV twice a week. I write a column in a prominent paper. I'm kind of famous. Go with the sex, it's better. <laughs> um, the real downsides were the effect on our society. Every true idea becomes false when you take it to an extreme. And we've sort of, over the last 40 or 50 years, we've sort of taken individual freedom to the extreme. And it's led to three overlapping crises. The first is a crisis of isolation. In 1980, 20% of Americans reported feeling lonely. Now it's 40%. In 1970, married couples entertained in their home 15 times a year. Now it's eight. 8% eight of Americans say they have important conversations with their neighbors. The more, America has no more American households with dogs than with children. The fastest growing political party is unaffiliated. The fastest growing religious movement is unaffiliated. Twice as many people now die of suicide than of car crashes. We're now at a 30 year high of suicide and suicide is just a proxy for loneliness. 45,000 people kill themselves every year in this country. 55,000 die of opiate addiction and that's just slow motion suicide. That's a process of isolation. The second is alienation. If you ask people a generation ago in that we're all in this communal culture. Do you trust the institutions of your society? 70 or 80% said, yeah, I trust the institutions of my society. Now it's 22%. If you asked people 40 years ago, do you, what about the people right around you? Do you trust the people right around you? 60% people said, yeah, I trust the people right around me. Now it's 32% and 19% of millennials. The, lower, the younger you get, the more distrust there is. And that's not as Robert, Putnam says of Harvard, that's not because perception is worse, it's because trustworthiness is lower. It's behavior, not perception. The third crisis is a crisis of meaning. It's amazing to me that given all we know about the brain, that mental health problems are on the rise, not the decline. Depression is on the rise, not the decline. I see it in my students, they graduate from Yale, they're amazing, then they have a setback and they crater. Nietzsche says, who, he who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. If you don't know why you're doing it, when the setbacks come, then the, and everything crashes down. 
And that's what I see in my students. And I don't blame them, because we give them garbage advice on how to find meaning in their life. We have absorbed an atmosphere of, of freedom. Everything's about freedom, being unattached, maximum flexibility. You, you look at the, I study commencement speeches, and it's so the whole freedom gospel. Our speakers get up there and say, be free. The whole point of life is to be free. Freedom is happiness. Explore your options. You do you. The students are graduating from college looking, well, what do I do with my life? Where do I plant myself? What do I dedicate myself to? And we say, no, just be open. It's like taking a drowning person and handing them a bunch of water. <laughs> They're drowning in their freedom. And then they say, well, what authority can I go to to find out what I should do with my life? And we give them authenticity. Look inside yourself. You do you. Follow your passion. That's the you is the exact thing that hasn't formed yet. And then they say, well, you know, give me some guidance. And, and they say, well, we give them the options of person possibility. Your future is limitless. Everything's amazing. And so they're looking for things, guidelines, to dedicate themselves, to commit themselves to, and we give them nothing. We not only give them a mountain of debt, we give them this garbage advice so they'll never pay it off. And what happens when you leave human beings naked and alone? They do what their evolutionary roots tell them to, which is they revert to tribe. And that's what's happened. You have, we have in our politics negative polarization. You ask people, do you like your party? Not really. Do you hate the other party? Totally. And that's negative polarization. Tribalism dominates our politics. It dominates our campus life. It's a certain mentality. It's based on a scarcity mentality. It's based on distrust, friend-enemy distinctions, us and them. It's my group against their group, and we're scrambling for resources. It's always a warrior mentality. Politics is war, ideas are combat, society is tribal. Build walls, erect barriers, keep me safe. I spent some time with Steve Bannon about a year ago, an afternoon, uh, and it was actually fascinating. It was like being with Trotsky in 1905. <laughs> uh, and what was interesting was he has a 100-year plan. And Trump is only a small piece of the plan. And he says, listen, your version of community is too attenuated. People need tribes. And I have to say, he personally may rise or he may fall, but tribalism is still on the march. I was in the early 90s. I covered Europe for the Wall Street Journal. And I covered amazingly good news most of the time. The end of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, unification of Europe, Mandela coming out of prison, the end of apartheid, the Oslo peace process. At the end of that period, I covered one thing I barely paid attention to, which was the Yugoslav Civil War. Bosnia, Serbia, if you remember. I should have paid more attention to that because that was the most important event I covered. Because the ensuing 25 years has been the rise of ethnic nationalism, the rise of authoritarianism, the retreat of democracy. And that's a global reversion to tribe. Uh, and so I look across society, and I think of George H.W. Bush, the elder Bush, walking across Yale's campus in 1941, hearing about Pearl Harbor and walking over to the enlistment station. And we don't have anything like Pearl Harbor. But it seems to me when the foundations of democracy are being shredded, that's kind of like a silent Pearl Harbor. When honesty is no longer respected, then that's sort of a silent Pearl Harbor. When 45,000 people kill themselves and 55,000 people die of opiate addiction, that's a silent Pearl Harbor. And we're all called to do something a little out of the ordinary, something we wouldn't do. So we can say, well, at least we weren't the generation that saw this country go into decline. And so I've been studying how do nations turn around. <clears throat> and there are many models. Uh, the best way is to get invaded. <laughs> <laughs> I used, to, I used to tell the joke, it would be nice if Canada invaded, but now it seems that might actually happen, so I don't, I don't tell that joke. <laughs> but if you look at, for the examples when societies turn around, the best example to me, and peacetime example, is the United States between 1880 and 1910. And three things happened. The first, a very communal ethos replaced a very individualistic one. In the 1880s, the dominant mental ethos of our country was social Darwinism. It was dog-eat-dog, -dog, survival of the fittest. That was replaced by the social gospel movement, a religious revival that said, no, we're, we're brother and sister to each other. We're part of one community. The second thing that happened was a wave of civic institution building. And so within five years, 
you saw this amazing rise of nonprofits. The Boys and Girl Scouts, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the NAACP, the labor unions, the environmental movement, the settlement house movement, the temperance movement. So people decided we need more community groups to help bind this country together. The third thing that happened was a political movement, the progressive movement. Clean government campaigns, federal reserve system, professional civil service, regulatory agencies like the FDA. So it was religious and cultural first, civic second, political third. And so now I look around the country today, what do we got? Well, I don't really see a religious revival. No evidence of it. I'm really dubious that American politics is gonna lead the way to change. That seems like a, lead, a lead, falling indicator, not a leading one. But we are seeing a civic revival. All around the country for the past 10 years, but especially for the past two years, there has been a rise of civic organizations designed to help address the crisis of, of isolation and fragmentation and division. And they fall into a bunch of buckets. There's a civic education bucket. How do we teach our history? How do we teach our unifying story? There's a social capital build bucket. Let's build communities. There's an economic mobilization bucket. How do we heal the economic divides? There's a racial bucket. How do we heal racial and ethnic divides? There's a depolarization bucket. How do we get red and blue together? There's a meaning bucket. There are just all these organizations that are flowing and forming as people spontaneously rise to the emergency before us. So we're seeing a civic revival. And it seems to me these community builders are the key to the national recovery. And one of the reasons I've come to Aspen with my colleague April Lawson, who's right here, and Tommy Loper, who some of you may know, uh, we and a small team at Aspen, funded by some very generous people, many of whom are in this room. The first thing we do, we want to know who are these community builders? and how can they lead us out of this morass? And the, the great thing about it is when you look at the community builders around here who are healing a social fabric, who are ending isolation in their areas, you barely notice who's in red and blue. They're happening in Burlington, Vermont, Salt Lake City, Utah, the West Village in Manhattan, and Greenville, South Carolina, and they talk the same. So the divisions don't exist on that level. The second thing, you're struck by the personalities. There's a wide variety of people who are healing communities. Some of them are kind of boring, like data people. They just want the analytics. Some have big, warm, embracing personalities. I know a guy named Mac McCarter, who was a Southern Baptist preacher in West Texas, and he read a book by Arnold Toynbee, and he read a sentence that said, society is a system of relationships. And he stood up. He said, society is a system of relationships. How do I build relationships? So he decided to take his Baptist church and he was going to build relationships and save society, but he realized the people in his Baptist church, they didn't really come to save society, they came to go to church. So he moved back to his home of Shreveport, Louisiana, and he decided I'm going to, which is a racially divided city, and he said I'm going to try to heal the city, the system of relationships. So he pulled into the, the low, high poverty African American neighborhood and he sat there in his car one Sunday morning and he thought he'd offer a prayer. And he thought, maybe it'll be just like a drive-by prayer. Maybe I won't have to get out. But he forced himself to get out. He went and started knocking on doors. And it was three years of knocking on doors before they trusted him. And now he's got something called Community Renewal International. There are 250,000 people in Shreveport. 55,000 are volunteers at Community Renewal International. And then every block in that city, there's what they call a haven house or a friendship house, a block on that street where it's the community is formed, that person is in charge of community on that block. Just amazing guy. You walk into a coffee shop, he's one of those guys, he walks into a coffee shop, and within 10 minutes, he's everybody's best friend. And then he goes back three times later, and like he's marrying them all. <laughs> he's just got that warm, glowing, incandescent personality. So there are a lot of people you meet who are like that. Some are not so, so nice. So, somebody on my team interviewed, um, a woman named Sharon Murphy who runs something called Mary House in DC, which is for immigrant and refugee families. And she said, you think we're all sweet and nice? We're not all sweet and nice. If you want to break these people or get into this community, you're going to have to walk through me. So there are some tough SOBs in the community building business. Some are motivated because of a hole in their own lives. We interviewed a guy named Darius when he was nine. His father had an affair with a stripper, and the stripper orchestrated his own murder. And so Darius had no dad at age nine and he now runs a, a football camp in DC to end that cycle of fatherlessness. 
I ran into a woman named Sarah in Baltimore, who was from a very religious community in Indiana. And her father reported on the embezzlement the pastor was doing. And instead of shunning the uh, pastor, they shunned the family, her family. And so she spent eight years of her childhood with none of her neighbors talking to her. She grew up without community. And now she runs an amazing organization called Thread, which creates community. So some have that sense of personal tragedy they are going to break. Others have no personal tragedy at all. They have the ethos, I am blessed, others suffer, this must end. And so there's amazing diversity in this community. But I've noticed two things that I have in common. First, a radical humility. They never have a sense, I'm doing something for people who are lesser or needier than me. It's always, we've all got our shit and we're fixing it together. And so one of the organizations, Thread, they banned the word mentor because they don't want it to seem like somebody is offering from high to low. It's we're all in this together and we're all radically equal. The second thing they have is vocational certainty. The people I've met so far are absolutely certain this is my calling, this is where I'm going to retire, this is where I'm going to die. It, unless you're around these people, most of us think, eh, my job has some good points and bad points. But these people all have a sense of this is who I am. Some of them are super heroic. Some of them are just normal. One of the people we interviewed, he's just the guy who works in his neighborhood parking garage, but he's good at helping people. So he's not a hero. It's somebody we could all be. But they have a sense, yeah, this is why God put me on this earth. More important than who they are is the institutions they are building. Becoming a Man is a Chicago organization where they take the kids in the most violent neighborhoods in west side of Chicago, these gang members, and they have a, a technology, a social technology they call the check-in. They sit around the room, and each person in the, in the circle of 10 or 15 men has to check in. How are you doing spiritually? How are you doing intellectually? How are you doing emotionally? And how are you doing physically? And for these guys, they're gang members. They have their armor up. And yet the ethos of the place, if you don't come fully out, they say, I challenge you, you're not coming out. And they break down the armor. And that's a way of establishing relationship. Thread, the woman from Baltimore, Sarah, her organization has 450 students whose average GPA is 0 0.45. And 4,000 adults, four adults per kid on the parent level. And then they have grandparents and then hire coaches. So she's basically created an artificial family. And what she has, everybody in her organization, the volunteers and the kids, she can locate them by their phone. And every time a parent one of the adults touches one of the kids, has a meeting, drives them to school, picks them up off the corner where they're selling drugs and drives them back to school, she can see it on her app. On her app. She calls it the Fitbit of social relationship. So she can do analysis in real time of who's being touched, who's not being touched. They're creating this system of creating relationships. And so what you see are these people creating new systems and creating new sorts of power. One of the things that's striking to me is the organizations that I'm used to and the movements that I'm used to from baby boomer era, they had a famous person on top and then a bunch of people down below. Martin Luther King, Betty Friedan, Gloria Steinem, Ralph Nader, Ronald Reagan. If you look at the movements that are super successful today, they have nobody on top. They have no leaders. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Tea Party. They're radically decentralized power structures. We're seeing a radical shift in how power is being organized in this society. But what they do have is an ethos of thickness. Some organizations you go through, and some colleges you go through, and they don't leave a mark on you. You work there, there was no big deal. You worked there, and then you left. But there are some organizations, some colleges, and some companies that are totally thick. When you met somebody who was a US Marine, you know it a Morehouse man, a Juilliard pianist. You know it because those organizations left a mark. And these organizations leave a mark. And I've been looking at them. What are, the, what are the features of organizations that are thick that leave a mark on you? They tend to gather in physical locations that are often cramped. They meet face to face on a regular day, so it's like a dinner table. They do collective rituals. They do activities where they have to observe each other closely. They often have retreats where they sleep overnight so they can see each other after the makeup has gone off at night and before they're really clear-eyed in the morning. They often have music involved because it's very hard not to be close to somebody you've danced with. They have an idiosyncratic local culture. I noticed this in colleges and companies. Some colleges and companies are just like every other college. 
but some are not afraid to be themselves and they're very idiosyncratic. You may hate them and you may love them, but they will be themselves. They have a sacred guidebook, a shared origin story, an organ a moment when their, their organization almost failed and came back from the dead. They have collective goals, a telos, and they, their purpose is not to use you for some other end. Their purpose is to transform who you are. And these organizations all have that. Because what impresses me most about these organizations is their personalism, what my wife Ann calls the whole person revolution. They're not just gonna use you for some skill you have. They're gonna take every piece of you and they're gonna transform it. And so well, one of the things I've, that I've struck is how unabashed these organizations, and we've only really been doing this a very short time and have only seen a relative handful, but the ones I've seen have been very unabashed in saying, we take ourselves, we're working here, we take the people we're serving, and we're doing two things. We're creating intimacy, and we're doing moral formation. You can't have trust unless we are all trustworthy. That means we have to do the hard work inside. It's very rare these days to find organizations that are doing spiritual and moral transformation and are completely unabashed about it. But that's what I find these people doing, the inner work. The main barrier to intimacy to our conversations for all of us is fear. There's all a fear. When we meet each other, we're afraid of being judged and rejected. We're afraid of disapproval. We're afraid of exposing our tender flesh. And all our lives, we work up strategies to avoid that. The roles we play, the shells. But it's great intimacy, they have to um, be shed. Gary Shandling once joked, my friends say I have an intimacy problem, but they don't really know me. <laughs> and what these organizations do is they demand what the, the Becoming a Man people call total honesty, or the Thread people call showing all the way up. When you're at a meeting, when you're in a conversation, you've got to show all the way up. And that means you can start by doing something superficial, talk about the movies you like, what are the playlists you have on your phone, then get a little deeper, what are the important moments of your life? And then phase by phase, moment by moment, conversation going through the gates, going to the deep center of themselves, getting to the things we all carry. And what they describe is the moral testing that goes on when we're really connecting with somebody. If I unveil myself, will you protect me? If I proceed cautiously, will you understand me and match my pace? If I pause, will you respect my pause and wait for me? If I reveal the scariest of the dark monsters, will you reveal yours? And it's that process of conversation and getting to know each other and creating connection, which is how intimacy, trust, and community is born, and there's no shortcuts for that. Emerson said that souls are not saved in bundles, they're saved one by one. And that's what these organizations are doing. And I must say, in a time of political dysfunction, it's, been, it's amazing to be around these people, and a lot of them are in the room probably tonight. The puzzle is that all these people are out there doing great work, but the great forces of alienation, loneliness, and fragmentation are still getting worse. So what do we do about that? And that's really what our project is. It's, it's called Weave, the Social Fabric Project. And that's what really we're trying to think through because these community organizations are like those at towns on the Italian hilltops. They've got great community there, but in the valleys and in between them, it's still pretty rough. So how do we create a climate in which it's not only a community here and a community there, but the nation is recovering, a nation that has a culture of community relationship connection across difference. And the only way you can do that is not only through an organizational tsunami, but a shift in culture, a shift in the whole national mentality that encourages more community and frankly less individualism. And so then the question becomes, how do you change culture? How do we take these people and change the culture? Well, history is a lesson for this. Cultures change when a small group of creative individuals on the fringe of society invent a better way to live and the rest of society copies them. You think of the hippies, you think of the feminists. That's how it happens. And so what's cheering to me is these community builders who are dedicating themselves to the communities in ways heroic and in ways ordinary, they've found a better way to live. 
I can't, I'm magnetized by them. They found better structures to live by. They have credibility at a time when few other institutions in society have credibility. And so when you see the communities builders, they're not only creating organizations, they're exemplars of a culture they can be. They're culture makers. Cultures sometimes change when somebody writes a book that changes the imagination of a society, whether it's Dickens, Tolstoy, Harriet Beecher Snow, Fred Rooks Douglas. These community builders are writing books with their own lives, living manifestos. And all we have to do is edit them, publish them, and promote these books. And that's really what we're trying to do, to bring their message to a wider world to shift the atmosphere. And so what we wants to do is celebrate them, publicize the intellectual breakthroughs they're making, synthesize the ethos and the values that you see that they embody, gather them together to think about cultural change, and if you know anybody, my email address, which is really on my phone, is david.brooks at aspeninstitute.org. We want to find them, so send me an email. Well, I'm, I'm inspired by a guy named Stuart Brand, who looked at the community healers in the 1950s, their communes, going back to the soil. And he created something called the Whole Earth Catalog which gave them tools and created an ethos. And out of that, the hippie ethos was born. He shifted the culture. And then the commune sort of fell apart. It's kind of hard to work on a farm, it turns out. <laughs> but he looked down, he was in Menlo Park, California. There's this thing called the Homebrew Computing Club. Maybe communes won't save society, but maybe computers will. And so in 1972, he wrote a story for Rolling Stone called The Rise of the Hacker Culture. And he created the ethos of Silicon Valley. And so there's a guy who shifted the culture twice by taking people who are doing cool things and saying, follow them. And that's frankly a lot of what we're doing. And so what has to happen is we just, there's a phrase um, in Prelude, what we will love, others will love, and we will teach them how. And there's a phrase in the book of Job, and the sparks fly upward. And when you see all these local community groups, you think the sparks are gonna fly upward. And we'll take what's good on a national level and we'll, or at a local level, and we'll nationalize it. We've had movements for feminists when there was gender inequality, as there still is. We've had an environmental movement to heal the environmental problem. We had a civil rights movement to deal with segregation. Now we have a community problem. Why shouldn't we have a community movement? And so that seems to be the task in front of us. And the final thing I'll end with is the central challenge for all of us is that we're all busy. And how do we actually get energized to actually do this? And so to me, I think about the times I've been super energized in my life, or I've seen other people super energized. When I was um, a young man, I had a kid born in Brussels, uh, and he was born with a super low APGAR score. And what happens in those circumstances is they whisk the kid up to intensive care. You don't really know what's going on. <laughs> and I remember thinking, uh, as he was gone, what would happen if he lived only 30 minutes? Would it be worth it for a lifetime of grief for his mother and I? And if you had asked me that question before he was born, I would have said, no way. How could a creature that doesn't even know it's alive be worth a lifetime of grief? But those of you who are parents will know that the lives of your sons and daughters have infinite value. So of course it would be worth a lifetime of grief just for that 30 minutes. And so what happens when parenthood strikes, and I was with some people last night at a dinner who were talking how shocked they were when parenthood strikes, how they discovered a love and a commitment that they were not aware of. And they found themselves doing things they did not know they were capable of. You wanna go out and play golf, and now you gotta push the baby carriage. And you become a slightly better person because this love and this commitment surprises you. You love something so much you're willing to really sacrifice for it. And that can happen on a family level. It can happen on a community level. That woman, I talk about Sarah, named Threat in Thread. She wears the city of Baltimore on her chest. She loves her city. 30 cities have asked her to bring her program to their city. She said, no, I'm going to fix Baltimore. And that local love is driving her. But I think we should all still have an American consciousness in our minds. And that love of America ultimately will drive us beyond where we think we are. And you see the expression of Love America driving people in ways all throughout our history. 
One of the most famous examples, it was written in July 14, 1861. A guy named Sullivan Ballou, probably, some of you probably know his letter. He was, it was the eve before the first battle of Manassas, and he was writing to his wife, Sarah. And he wrote her a letter and said, you know, my parents died when I was young. I know what it's like to be an orphan. And tomorrow I'm going to go to battle, and I may leave our children orphans. And he wrote, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence could break. Yet my love of country comes before me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on all these chains to the battlefield. I know how strongly American civilization now leans upon the triumph of our government and how great the debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life and to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. And when you think of all the people who gave us what we're privileged to enjoy, passing on that debt seems like the least we can do. Thank you. I've left a few minutes for Q&A so we can talk about Paul Manafort now. Um, I think there are three microphones. Um, all that I ask is you make your questions long and rambling with no question at the end. Um, uh, there's one hand I see over here. On David, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Alejandra Castillo and I actually have an invitation um, I am the CEO of the YWCA USA, and I invite, you, I invite you to engage us. We are celebrating 160 years of service, and we are one of those organizations that you mentioned. Um, so I look forward to engaging with you because we like to say that we don't have, all of our YWCAs don't necessarily have pools, <laughs> but we help women when they feel like they're drowning. And we are serving uh, communities all across America. And what you say is true. There is a crisis, and we are seeing it. I leave here to go to McAllen, Texas, because what's happening across the border, or along the border, is real. And when I think about separating from our children, is something that is, um, is painful. So I look forward to reaching out to you. I'll be there. Uh, the first thing to say, and this is one thing that strikes me, is that in the era where the YWCA was formed, the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Boys and Girls Scouts, they were somehow able to create an organization that scaled massively quickly. And somehow we're not able to do that. I don't know the, why that is, but somehow we have to figure out how, because they really had a national effect reasonably quickly. Anyway, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, over here. Yes, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, what you say is inspirational and wonderful. Do you sometimes feel like Butch and Sundance coming out with your guns blazing <laughs> only to find out 10 seconds later, as I'm sure you already know in advance, uh, the forces of what I'll call evil that you're up against and how massively they seem to be growing and how well-funded they are? And if your answer to that is yes, then how do you respond to that and how do you feel yeah. about it? Thank you, Larry, for that tough question. Uh, so if you've read my column over the last year, which I don't recommend, but um, like some of the columns are like, we're doomed, we're doomed. And the other columns is, this is great. Things are improving. Like, I'm totally bipolar. Um, so and I think the forces that are really challenging us are sometimes very pervasive. Some are intellectual, like intellectual, cultural. Some are actual forces that are trying to divide us, nativism, uh, racism. But the one thing I'd say is I would not, I, it's never good to bet against this country or any country for two reasons. One is the heart and the soul really do drive us very powerfully to connect with each other. And that can get twisted and perverted, but we really do have this instinct to be around each other. 
And the second thing, there's a, a social theorist, I've forgotten her name, she's a theory that culture moves forward by a pattern she calls ratchet, hatchet, pivot, ratchet. So the cultures are collective exercises in solving our problems. In the, in the 30s and 40s, they had to face big problems, so they had needed big organizations, the armies, the labor unions, so they collected big, or they had a very collective culture. That stopped working, so they hatched it up, 1968. And they pivoted over to an individualistic culture, which solved the problem at that moment. And now we've run out the string on that one, and everyone's sort of hatching it up. And those hatchet moments when we chop up the old culture are bumpy. 1968, 1905, 1848, 1932. But never underestimate human ingenuity. We pivot, we find a solution to our problems, and we ratchet up again. And so the history of cultural history has been periods of achievement, periods of crisis, and then periods of more achievement. And I think we're just going to follow that pattern. Maybe one more over there. Talked about bookishness. What are you reading this summer? <laughs> I'm reading a, a 1950s book called the, uh, the Quest for Community by a guy named Robert Nisbet, which is a beautiful description of what it's like to, for alienation. I'm always bad at answering that question because in my job at the Times, I don't have meetings. Uh, I have interviews, but I don't really talk to anybody. People, all I do is read books. So I'm reading nine or 10 or 11 books at a time. And I don't consume them the way normal people do. And the bad part is um, I don't enjoy them the way I used to. I used to be, the, you've got to be careful about this. I used to be a movie critic. Uh, and I interviewed all the stars. I got to interview Catherine Hepburn and Burt Lancaster. I knew Tom Cruise was a jerk even early on. Uh, but when you're a movie critic, uh, you go to 10 movies a week. You have your notepad up. And your notepad is between you and reality. So you can never lose yourself in a movie, and you lose the ability to tell whether you like a movie. And we would, I would ride the elevator down from the screening room with all the other critics, and we'd sort of look at each other. Did we like it? Did we like it? Because we lost the ability to have an organic response. And it strikes me that a lot of us, um, we have notebooks up all the time, even in reality. And we're distancing ourselves from reality. We're not really engaged in it emotionally. Uh, and so life, a lot of times, is just about putting down that notebook. Uh, and I've, I've got to put down my notebook about the books I'm reading. If anybody has recommendations, I could use that, too. <laughs> Maybe back there. Thank you for an incredibly inspirational presentation. I'm not a CEO of anything major. I'm just a person. But we're all just people. And I'm thinking, if each of us feels this way, feels the way you do, can't we, uh, through that individualism, create the spirit of community to speak to the 10 people closest to you, get them to understand, develop your, your own communities, and then spread, spread that out amongst the communities at large, and sort of in a grassroots way, get us out of this mess. So I, I have a weakness when I talk about this. I emphasize the heroes who are who like they founded Teach for America. But that's not how most of it happens. I have a colleague who just was at dinner last night, and his wife was a lawyer. And she, but then when her kids came, she was bowled over by how much she wanted to stay home and take care of them. Now she, they got to a certain age. She can devote more time to the community. And she teaches at the local elementary school. She volunteers at the local library. She volunteers at every local organization. And that's the way community actually gets built. It's not only through the superheroes. And the way it gets built, it's interesting. I have a friend named Rod Dreher who had a, who had a sister named Ruthie. And Ruthie was one of those incandescent light people. She just glowed. And unfortunately, she died in her early 40s. And she was a school teacher in this little town in northern Louisiana. There are 800 people in the town, but 1,600 people showed up at her funeral because she had that kind of effect. And uh, she loved to go barefoot, so her husband was a fireman, and the fireman carried her casket to the grave barefoot, just in honor of her. And one of the things she used to do is, um, on Christmas Eve, she wanted to uh, remember the dead of the town. So she went to the town cemetery, and she put a candle on each grave. And she died just before Christmas, and Rod was back with his mom and family. And on Christmas Eve, he asked her, do you want to do what Ruthie used to do, put a candle on the graves? 
And his mom said, you know, normally I'd, I'd love to do that. It would be a nice tribute to Ruthie, but this year she's just died. It's just too tough. I just can't do it. So they decided not to do it, and they drove to across town to visit a relative, and they happened to drive by the cemetery, and somebody else had put a lit candle on every gravestone. And so that's sort of how community works. It's like somebody sets a standard. This is how we do things here. And somebody else just picks it up. And that's the kind of community that um, that's how it actually gets built, not only through heroic organization. Maybe we have time for one more. Maybe over there. The um, whole idea of, of weaving um, really intrigues me. I've been teaching a long time at an independent school in Baltimore. And um, part of this feels like a numbers game, that, that if we're going to weave a tapestry, we have to figure out a way to drop kids into the tapestry and not drown, but they'll be snagged. Some won't, some will. So I, uh, briefly, my question is, I have no plan, but my question is, the, the idea of a gap year is, I think, underutilized in society. In fact, too many parents, in my experience in education, sort of, they don't demonize it, but it's, it's not utilitarian. How can Aspen Ideas, how can we um, move that idea of a gap year after high school, after college, my older daughter um, got snagged by AmeriCorps um, after she rejected Peace Corps for various reasons, and now she's in the tapestry. Um, what's your feeling about gap year, and how can we um, have some sort of, you know, not, not, I'm not for service man mandating, but that, that kind of idea? Yeah. Well, first, as uh, someone who spends a lot of time around college freshmen, I'm totally pro gap year. <laughs> they, need, they need another year. <laughs> uh, I mean, especially the guys, they're just not ready. Uh, and so I'm for them that front. Second, you know, my partner, Mark Shields, he said that he's from South Boston, Irish guy from South Boston. He said the first time I ever met an African American, I was showering with them in the Marine Corps. And they, that kind of connection, and it would just be great if people from Burlington, Vermont could spend a year with people from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and, you know, and just meet people completely unlike themselves. So I'm, I'm totally for that sense of, you know, I'm going to give a year back to this country. Uh, and I, it's amazing to me that it's the most obvious thing that I think most people support, and I can tell you it's a political dead letter. Uh, and that's the way our politics is getting in the way of where our society needs to be. But the second thing about the weaving, I want to go back to something that, um, that these groups emphasize, the radical equality. I've mentioned at Aspen for I'm one of the highlights of my life is I, I got involved in a group called AOK. -okay. And I stumbled upon it four years ago. A friend of mine who's an opera singer invited me to go to a house in, in, in um, DC. And the couple who found the house uh, are named Kathy and David. And they had a kid in the DC public schools. And uh, that kid had a friend who had no, whose mom was sort of on drugs and had health issues, no dad. So had nowhere to sleep or eat. And so they said, well, James can come over. Uh, and uh, James came over, stayed with them, and then James had a friend, and the other kids had a friend. And uh, pretty soon you went to their basement, and there were 25 beds in the basement, mattresses. And I go over every Thursday night to their house, and there's 30 kids around the table. And there was a woman named Lark who was 21. She said, I haven't been in a dining room table for 10 years. Last Christmas, we celebrated Christmas with them. A lot of the kids didn't know how to open um, a Christmas present. Do you untie the bow? Do you slid it off? They just didn't, hadn't had the experience. And what's interesting about that is that it doesn't feel like we adults are helping those kids. Because A, they're giving us a complete intolerance of social distance. So they're entertaining us. They're hugging us. They're helping us solve our own loneliness problem. And it's just like we're all in this together. Like I've been with these kids for four years. We've all got our problems. We all lay our shit on the table on Thursday nights, and we all try to deal with it together. And frankly, there are two people in this room. I'm going to embarrass the Resnicks and Gilchrist Berg, who have been generous to this community. Uh, and it's radical equality, and it's just weaving. We're all there for each other. 
And so when, you, when I, I leave that home, I took my daughter there, and she said, that's the warmest place I've ever been. And when I leave that home on Thursday at 9.30 p.m. after dinner, and I go back to my normal life, I think the answer to our problems is that. And that, there are people like that everywhere across America, and potentially many more. It's just a matter of rallying them, making them famous, and creating a culture that valorizes that. Thank you.